Hello and welcome back to the Ever-Changing World Podcast. I'm your host, Ava Zanetti, and in today's episode, I want to focus on a topic that I believe I've touched on in a lot of ways, but also not. Uh, It's a really weird kind of topic that I want to delve into. Maybe not weird, but I was on Forbes, as I usually am, and I was thinking of podcast ideas, and I saw a bunch of news about fintech. So what fintech basically is, which I'll give a better description in a moment, but as the name states, is financial technology. So it's a finance world with tech. Um, since the 2001 kind of, you know, dot-com bust, and all of the, you know, <laughs> it, it was, the internet has been cultivated, Technology has been a major role in our markets uh, and in businesses and in companies. So it's not a surprise that this is an area that we are focusing a lot on. And fintech actually is really huge. So I wanted to talk about it because um, what has just come out is the fintech 50 of 2022, which I thought was interesting. And I thought that I could kind of explore and delve into that topic. I think talking about things like the metaverse and multiple other kind of financial topics, I have delved into fintech, but I've never really clearly stated what it is, why we're talking about it, and all of these other things that really make fintech fintech. Uh, so that's what I really wanted to focus on in today's episode. Before I get into that, I just want to recommend a few past episodes that may be good if you're listening to this. Um, I think that, actually, I haven't talked about Elon in a while, but Elon is no longer buying uh, Twitter. And I don't know if I said that in a past episode, but it's been so long that I don't quite remember. But Elon Musk is no longer buying Twitter, and there's been a lot of drama with that, but I don't need to get into that today. Um... Yes, I talked about Web3, so that was really big, and that, I guess, kind of works in with fintech. Uh, I've talked a lot about stock markets, NFTs, which kind of works in with it, not really, but you get the idea, as well as Metaverse and uh, a few other things. I've talked about crypto a lot, too. So if you want anything else that's kind of fintech-related, I'd probably recommend the Metaverse. Um, but there was a few other things as well that are in there that I think would be really helpful. Um, but to start off, we need to understand what is fintech or financial technology and why it's such a booming business in general. So this is from the Foo Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science at Columbia University, and they have a beautiful article here talking about fintech and financial markets that I want to delve into. So really the basic description is that fintech or financial technology is a catch-all term referring to software, mobile applications, which is apps, and other technologies created to improve and automate traditional forms of finance for businesses and customers alike. Fintech can include everything from straightforward mobile payment apps to complex blockchain networks, housing encrypted transactions. So if you kind of delve back into your brain from when I talked about cryptocurrency, we know that cryptocurrency is run on a blockchain. And cryptocurrency really is a a form of this fintech. Um, It allows you to purchase things and using technology pretty much. Other things that could kind of quantify it, uh, the man who went into space use it through SpaceX, who's a billionaire, I can't, Jared Letterman, I believe is his name, let me make sure I got that name right, but he created the, uh, tap, when you tap your, um, your, uh, debit card, he created that, I want to make sure I got the right name, though, uh, let me see here, Jared Letterman, Isaac Men. sorry, not Letterman, I don't know where I got that, Isaac Men. yeah, he's the creator of Shift 4, So the, basically what you're, when you use your debit card, uh, which is really interesting. So, uh, like the tap. So, uh, he's been really successful and that's kind of another form of financial technology. That's Jared Isaacman, not Letterman. Um, but he's done a lot of really cool stuff with that as well. 
So fintech really is kind of this catch-all term. So um, a little bit of a 101, the basics, is first, what is kind of a basic definition? So the term fintech company describes any business that uses technology to modify, enhance, or automate financial services for businesses or consumers. Some examples include mobile banking, peer-to-peer payment services, which can be things like Cash App or Venmo, automated profile managers, which can be kind of things like Betterment, uh, or trading platforms such as Robinhood, where you can trade on the stock market. It can also apply to the development and trading of cryptocurrencies. So, as I mentioned, cryptocurrencies is another form of fintech. So, a lot of things I talk about on this podcast are forms of fintech, and that's why I was such a surprise I hadn't done an episode yet just about what is fintech. It's a little bit of a history. Um, so, fintech, obviously, it sounds like a term that we use now since technology is really huge and we're doing a lot of things with technology with finance. But really, if we're really going to delve back, it really starts with credit cards, and that starts in the 1950s. And this kind of represents the first fintech product. Um, And it really just eliminated the need for consumers to carry physical currency in their day-to-day lives. So it, you know, now we use credit cards all the time and debit cards. So it seems weird that people didn't. But it really was this big, big breakthrough where people weren't having to carry their dollar bills or their coins and all these other things. And it just continued from there. In 1998, PayPal was founded, um, actually by Elon Musk and uh, Peter Thiel and a few others um, who kind of were the grounds for that. And that was kind of one of the first fintech companies um, that were really on the internet. So again, another big breakthrough. So when we had credit cards, it was a big breakthrough because, you know, no more using paper And then when we had something like PayPal, it was a big breakthrough because now we could use it on our technology. So this fintech revolution has led to mobile payment apps, which we see tons of. Um, If you have an iPhone, if you go into your iPhone wallet, you can put your credit card on there and pay. Um, Blockchain networks and social media house payment options we regularly use today. So what... If we're going into fintech, we need to kind of ask the question, okay, well, how does this work? It's great we kind of understand what fintech is and all these other things, but how does it work? So it's very, it's a very broad term and um, it, you know, is kind of a big catch-all term, but really it's about transactions and this can be using things like a blockchain as I've talked lots of blockchains in my cryptocurrency episodes so go watch that if you want to or listen to it if you want to understand that but it's really about this big term that other things can be used like AI and big data just a really big network that is controlling this Um, as well they're really just trying to fix the transaction process for consumers um, so kind of cutting out the middle of the man and just going from one thing to another. So again, Fenmo or Cash App allows you to pay other people any time of the day. Um, on your mobile bank app, you probably have a, um, e-transfer, which I use a lot. Um, as well, you know, if you pay with cash or check, the recipient would have to make a trip to the bank to deposit the money. So cash is kind of one of those things that is getting phased out with things like cryptocurrency, but as well as things like our own mobile bank apps that are just as simple and, uh, you know, do similar things. So over the years, some trends, um, fintech has grown and changed in response to developments within the wider technology sector. In 2022, the growth is defined by several prevailing trends. So first is the digital banking continues to grow. So when we're looking at digital banking, it's easier than ever. I think every single bank has their own app that you can download. And I know mine, I use Scotiabank. I go on it all the time, transfer funds, transfer between accounts, all of that. And it's super easy. Uh, Many consumers already manage their money, as I mentioned, request and pay loans, purchase insurance through digital first banks. You can even pay your bills just virtually, which is so much easier. 
The simplicity and convenience will likely drive additional growth in this sector, with the global digital banking platform expected to grow at a compound annual growth of 11.5% by 2026. So it's a big market, it's growing quick, and people are jumping on it because people just don't want to deal with physical cash anymore. It's such an inconvenience. When everything's already done on our phones, we can just, we can do everything on our phones. We can, you know, check the weather, we can, you know, take photos, our emails are all on there, social media, we can contact people, music, food, drink, everything is on there. So why wouldn't we? Um, And it's just, you know, something that banks are jumping on because they realize that their traditional is just not working anymore. The second big sector in fintech, as I mentioned before, is blockchain. So this, again, I'm going to reiterate it from past episodes. It allows decentralized transactions without government entity or third-party organization being involved. This is huge because people don't want another party controlling their money. They don't want taxes involved. They don't want different things being involved. They don't want people looking at their money. And they also want to make sure it's secure. The great thing about blockchain is you can verify a person. You can make sure the transaction actually works. And it is so backed up by like thousands of computers all over the world that you know there's really no way to break it. Um, and blockchain technology and applications have been growing quickly over years, and 2022 is likely a continuous trend. Um, so blockchain is just growing even without cryptocurrency. Blockchain is growing for security of many things, and it is just a very, very, very secure and safe network that really can't be broken. And then finally, the third one is AI, or artificial intelligence, and ML, or machine and learning. So both of these technologies um, have changed how fast and how efficient that these companies scale. So it really has been redefining the services they offer to clients. They can reduce operational costs, increase the value provided to clients, and detect fraud. As these technologies become more affordable and accessible, expect them to play an increasingly large role in fintech's continued evolution, especially as more brick-and-mortar banks go digital. So AI and machine learning, I mean, as everyone jokes, they're going to take our jobs, but really, realistically, they are. Um, these technologies are so quickly growing and so valuable and so much easier uh, than a human, you know, trying to manage all of this that, it's really undeniable that it's it's going to take over the world in a lot of ways. So, you know, kind of get used to it. Um, but as well, uh, it's exciting and it's good that these things are growing. So, different technologies power fintech, as I've mentioned. And these are really how they transfer, store, and protect all the different kind of currencies. Um, as well, big data, which is another topic I will be talking about in future episodes, as the war on big data will be huge, um, really help companies, you know, kind of predict changes in the market and create new data-driven business strategies. So blockchain and newer technology within finance allows for decentralized transactions without input through a third party. We want to cut out the middleman. Having a network of blockchain participants oversee potential changes or additions to encrypted data and make sure that it's obviously secure and safe. So it's very difficult to hack into these things. And then again, leading into safety, how safe are these? Um, really, they are generally trusted. So according to Forbes, 68% of people are willing to use financial tools developed by non-traditional, so kind of non-banks institutions. Though many fintech applications are relatively new and they're currently not regulated the same as banks are. And since a lot of these things are decentralized and they aren't run by a third party, it is kind of difficult if you are a newcomer and you don't really understand the language or don't really understand it to make sure you understand and trust, you know, who you should trust when you're investing your money or trading your money or using a certain app. Because just like cryptocurrency and just like any of these new things like NFTs, there's a lot of just fake things out there, a lot of things that shouldn't be trusted regardless of uh, what you think so it's one of those things that you got to make sure you are safe and you you watch out for um though it is generally really safe especially the established ones but again that's the same thing with banks you're not gonna walk into a bank on the corner of the street that you've never seen before that just popped up and trust it right you're gonna trust an established bank and as well although there aren't safety regulations 
a lot of these things are way more encrypted than things like banks are, so you should trust them probably a little bit more. Um, again, it's not that consumers do, uh, shouldn't trust fintech companies, it means to be careful. So, um, <clears throat> there's a little graph here, and it's the top reasons consumers use fintech. So 33% um, of consumer adopters turn into someone other um, turn to someone other than their main first bank. So we're already about a third of people already not using banks first. So the eight percent of consumers would consider non-financial services for a company for financial services, and 46% of consumer adopters are willing to share their bank data with other organizations, which I think I've probably done as well. Um, I think lots of people are way more trusting now, and they're also realizing where the future is headed, and they're realizing that's not in the banks anymore. So there's a few different types of fintech as we move to this. So the first one is Robinhood, as I've already mentioned, and this is stock trading. It's actually probably one of the easiest places to trade stocks, and I know a lot of people who really enjoy it and use it really well. Um, and it's one of these apps that you can do digital stock trading. So it distills the traditional broker-client relationship into an easy access online interaction. Robinhood founders saw the investment platforms charge high fees to their customers, even though executing trades doesn't cost much. In response, the company launches fee-free trading platform, allowing smartphone users to trade stocks more freely. The service offers commission-free stock trading and extended traded funds. And it also recently started crypto trading. So Robinhood is, you know, a big force in the market. There's a few other ones as well, but they're a really big force. Um, in terms of stock trading, that really is, uh, it, it really opens the doors up for everybody. The next one is Venmo. I think we all know what Venmo is, but it's a P2P payment resource or a service that allows to perform transactions quickly through digital direct, direct digital file sharing. So companies like Venmo make it easy for people to initiate free transactions with their friends and family or low fee payments for businesses. Most notably, the company frames its transactions through a social feed, making it possible to share and with a friend list. So it's kind of like e-transfer, though it's also way easier. Another one that I haven't really heard of, but is big, I'm pretty sure in the e-commerce um, space, I'm not really huge in that space, but I know it's pretty big, is Clarina, or Clarina, sorry, and that it provides payment services for e-commerce or broadly activity compromising any activity compromising a digital transaction. So it features direct payments and different payment services. It's a regular bank that allows customers to purchase something on a buy now, pay later model. Actually, I do believe I've seen this um, when I purchase things online, but I've never used it. With products being purchased on interest-free or low-interest installment payments, splitting a transaction in this way allows customers to pay for a product over time rather than all once. I think I've seen iterations of this virtually but this one's really big because people don't like paying things in full all the time or they don't have the money to pay things in full all the time so this is a really big one another one that's big is wealthfront this one's really big with wealth management it is a robo advisor so it uh helps users by automatically investing their money and providing financial advice based on their goals uh they use computer algorithms and special software to build an investment portfolio without input from a financial advisor it automatically invests and rebalances investments based on your needs, goals, and market conditions. Well, front in particular offers automatic rebalancing, daily tax loss harvesting, and other services rooted in automatic investing, which can benefit investors by making their investments easier to manage without traditional manual intervention. Again, we're just cutting out all the people that are involved in these uh, workplaces. Square is the final one, and this is business payments. Again, big. Um, it is a point-of-sale payment service for businesses, meaning it allows businesses to accept credit cards on a smartphone, tablet, or terminal. This one I have seen absolutely everywhere. I was just at the Kendrick Lamar concert in Toronto the other day, and, uh, there was this guy, there's always those guys who have, like, they're selling, like, $20 shirts instead of the $65 ones he paid for, even though I paid for the expensive one, of course, and he's coming around, and then he... He's like, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, and he has Square on his on his device. So this is huge. It's really good for people who are just kind of doing something where they don't need a proper statement and then people who kind of just tap their phones or their debit cards. And before companies like Square, small businesses sometimes had trouble accepting credit cards due to high fees and difficult equipment. So this is really an easy-to-use product that also can print receipts, which is very big because people like physical receipts 
So there's a few different things here that you can learn a little bit about fintech more um, that I kind of want to briefly talk about here. Um, if you want to learn more about fintech, I'm also linking this article in the description. It's the Columbia article. You can do some fintech boot camps where uh, you can kind of learn more about the models. You can also get degrees. You can self-teach yourself fintech, listen to this podcast. Hopefully this helped a bit, which we're talking a little bit more. And then as well, some fintech careers. One is a financial analyst, which make a pretty good amount of money. Um, financial specialist, information security analyst, blockchain engineers. So there's tons of jobs in this area. It's a quick, fast-paced growth area. And for any job, you want to be in a fast-paced environment because that is going to have the best return on your time and on your investment. So fintech is huge. It's a huge market. You got to get in. So I kind of want to move away from describing what fintech is. And maybe I'll see if there's anything else that I want to briefly speak about. But I really want to dive out of that and dive into some of the fintech news. So, um, Forbes put out the article, The Future of Investing, Fintech 50 2022. So, fintech is obviously huge, and there's huge companies that are coming in. And I want to speak about some of these companies, if this article will load. So, of course... Um, as there has been really high interest rates lately, the Russian-Ukrainian war is still unfortunately going on, um, and, you know, inflation has been going crazy, the stock market has been going crazy. Um, these four companies that we're going to mention have picked up millions of customers and billions of dollars in assets despite this turmoil. So the first big company that I want to speak about um, and a lot of actually people have invested in these ones and I can also explain the first company though is guideline um, so administrators 401k plans for small businesses uh, for a base fee of forty nine dollars per month plus eight dollar participating per participating employee so this so partners with payroll service providers including square which we've mentioned in still gusto and ADP New state laws like the one in California requiring businesses with five or more employees to offer a requirement savings plan by June 30th are helping to drive growth. In April, being uh, being offering SERP IRAs for self-employed, too. So this is based in Austin, Texas. There has been $344 million of funding from General Atlantic, General Investment Management, Grand Capital, and others. Latest valuation is $1.15 billion dollars. And as well, administrators more than 30,000 small businesses, 401ks, to 50% over last year. And the co-founder is CEO Kevin Burst, who's 43, who also co-founded freelance labor market Task Rabbit, and the CTO Mike Nelson, who's chief product officer Jeremy Kellerbro, 39, and then Mike Nelson is 34. So this one is really huge because companies are, you know, even small businesses are having to give their employees proper retirement plans and promise them that they are going to help them in the future. And this is a little bit scary for companies because, to be quite honest, it's a lot of work. And companies don't really want to do that work. So they will kind of do anything to get out of that. So um, this company is administrating all of that work, doing the 401k plans, and it's allowing you know a $50 you know about bucks per month which isn't really that much and then eight dollars per employee so let's say you only have five employees like in California where if you have five or more you have to do this it's really not that much money and depending on how much deals you're generating this is going to be a lot less hassle than actually doing the 401k plans yourself especially when you're busy running your own business and company so guideline is really huge and I think it's going to grow a lot and had already grown a ton. Uh, it's been up 50% over last year, which is really high growth. The next one is iCapital. This one connects more than 10,000 financial advisors and hundreds of thousands of high net worth clients to provide equity, private debt, venture capital, real estate, and hedge funds with as little of as 25,000 invested per fund, much lower than traditional minimums for these funds. 
which can run up to 1 million up to 10 million. Now providing its white label service to more than 140 firms, including Blackstone, the Caracol Group, Bookfields, UPS, UBS, Dirsch Bank, and Goldman Sachs. This is in New York City. Funding has been $765 million from BlackRock, Westcap, Tesmec, and others. The latest valuation is $6 billion. Um, assets invested through the platform have sold um, to some $125 billion, up about 70% in one year, thanks to part expansions across Europe and Asia. The co-founders have been CEO Lawrence Calcino, 59, a 17-year veteran of Goldman Sachs, and managing partners D- Dan Veen, 46, and Nick Virgos, 57. So, this is another really big one, as it's connecting a group of people who usually have this kind of traditional job, and it's giving them this platform where they get direct connections to these really, you know, rich and wealthy and powerful people that need things done for them that they, to be honest, quite don't want to do. Um, and they are able to do this themselves, manage it through this fintech app, and do it, uh, in a safe way. So, another thing that was mentioned is much lower than traditional minimums for these funds. They run up to 1 million, up to 10 million. So, they are allowed to, in, um, as little as 25,000 invested per fund. So, they can invest lower amounts of money as well, which is really huge as a lot of people don't want to invest really huge amounts in certain things. And this overall is really big for the financial advisors, but as well for the higher net worth clients. Because this is a really easy way for them to kind of look through a bunch of financial advisors, almost like a Tinder date swiping app, and then pick who is right for them. So this is the second one. The third one is public.com. So this is a brokerage app offering commission-free investing in stocks, ETFs, and crypto, as well as fractional trading on NFTs and other collectibles and ability for users to share their portfolios and trades if they want to. Last year, Public.com stopped taking payment for overflow, controversial practice that free trading rivals like Robinhood still rely on, and debuted an optional tipping feature. In April, it launched another new revenue source, a Pulse service, that allows companies wanting to promote their stocks to pay for data, but realtor investors and whole town halls. Early customers include Buzzy Cannabis Stock Tilray and Dubai Rider Handler Swoof. So they are also in New York City. They've had $310 million of funding from Acel, Greycoff, Tiger Global Management, and others. The latest valuation is $1.2 billion. User base has explored to $3 million from less than $1 million at the end of 2020. And the co-CEOs, Jack Melling, 34, and Leif Abraham, 36, here are entrepreneurs, and they're from Denmark and Germany, respectfully. So, this app is really big, because as I mentioned, Robinhood is really big. And Robinhood is one of those things that people love to use. It's probably the biggest one that I've ever, you know, heard of in a lot of ways. And uh, it's just a huge app, because it's so easy to use, it's so accessible. But Public is a big competitor, and a competitor that is doing an important thing to be a competitor. They are differentiating themselves by not basically taking your money. Um, as, as bad as this sounds, um, they overflow is really big, and uh, it's you know very controversial because you don't want your money taken from you. But you almost have to through these different apps. But Public has found a different revenue source that works really well for them that doesn't have to take um, their users' money, which gets them more users. And then that gets more companies wanting to kind of advertise their stocks to said users. Um, So it's kind of, it works hand in hand. And it's this model that is, it's almost like a circle and it's the spinning wheel that it's going to keep working and running um and and keep growing so that one's growing really quick and the final one here in this article is stash so stash offers financial investing in stocks and etfs ris checking accounts and a debit card that rewards purchases with fractional shares for flat monthly fee of one to nine dollars in january it ruled out smart portfolio a stash managed portfolio matched to an investor's risk tolerance the five dollar million $5 minimum investment and a 4-6% to accolation to crypto, 
Already, 500 million users have put money into smart portfolios. Last summer, Stash acquired financial literacy platform Paygrade and rebranded it to Stash 101, offering free educational content for students, teachers, and parents. So this is built in New York City. The funding is $467 million from Union Square Ventures, Goodwood Art Capital, Eldridge Industries, and others. It has a latest valuation of $1.3 billion. The revenue grew from 65% to 8 Eighty-six million grew sixty-five percent to eighty-six million dollars in twenty twenty-one, while paying customers grew from one point eight million to two point four million. So the co-founders have been CEO Brandon Craig, forty-seven, and President Ed Robinson, thirty-six, who met working at McIlwain's electric electronic trading team. So they have a lot of um, background in this kind of fintech area. Um, and the big thing about this smart portfolio is that it allows users to um throw in a money put in how much risk they're uh, you know willing to put and this is big too because it's not this uh, you know it is you know the ai generated ones are great but this is good too because you can say okay this is how much risk i want um and then it'll match things that align with that risk and uh it makes you obviously you know less afraid and all these different things for if you're actually being traded properly, etc. Um, so, um, it is a five dollar minimum investment. So you only you could all, all you could just put five dollars in, which is really crazy. It's a really low amount, and uh, afford it to six percent accolation of crypto. So as well, you can they do accolate, a, you know, a little bit to cryptocurrency, which is also big because that is also another big growing market. So this is really big because smart portfolios um, it is something that's easy and simple. If people are busy, they can put their money in and they can trust it. So those are kind of four really big companies within the FinTech 50. And as well, I wanted to mention some of the newcomers. So um, we have a few here. I want to see five six seven eight oh my gosh nine ten eleven twelve thirteen oh there's so many okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna do a few that pop out to me as i'm scrolling through here um the first one is called ava labs and the reason why i'm gonna do this one is because it does have my name in the title i know a little self-conceited there um but this is built in new york new york the funding is six million from anderson Hollowitz, polychain industrial capital and others um it has over 2.4 million users, Avalanche's token AvaX has 8.5 billion market capitalization. So the co-founders have been CEO Emin Gersirer, 50, former Cornell University computer science professor, known for his research and distributed system, and COO Kevin Sunak, 28, chief protocol architect Ten Lin, 27. So creator of Avalanche, a competitor to Ethereum, the most popular decentralized blockchain platform that applications can run on top of. Over the past year, more than 500 decentralized finance apps have been built on Avalanche, which can process 45,000 transactions per second, compared to just 14 per second for Ethereum. So this is an insanely, 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 with that number, again, I want to repeat it, um, Avalanche can process 4,500 4, transactions per second, compared to 14 per second for Ethereum, which is the biggest one. I mean, th there's no other way to put it than saying Avalanche is, is huge and this is way better than Ethereum and is going to grow really quickly because of this. So this is a really helpful one that, not just because it's my name, but people should look into because just the mere amount of transactions um, is insane. Um, so another one is Clear Code. So the reason why I want to mention this one, it spoke out to me while I was going down, is because of Michelle Romano. So a little bit of backstory. I am obsessed with Shark Tank and Dragon's Den. Um, I am American, but I live in Canada, so I love both, of course. And, um, you know, I watch Dragon's Den a lot when, you know, Kevin O'Leary and uh, um, a few others were on it, uh, Robert Herjavec, and then they moved to Shark Tank, so I watched a lot of Shark Tank. But it still kept up with Dragon's Den, and one woman who was on it was Michelle Romano, the youngest dragon. And she is absolutely amazing. She went to the Shad program that I mentioned in two episodes ago that I just went to. Um, and as well, she is Canadian, and she went to school in Canada. She's done a lot of really big things. Um, and this is actually a unicorn. 
um, company. So that is when the valuation before the company really even gets off is valued at $1 billion. So this is a unicorn company, and that's why I want to mention this. So ClearQuo is based in Toronto, Canada. Funding has been $600 million from SoftBank, Oak, HC, such FT, Social Ventures, and others. It has a $2 billion valuation as of late. And it has deployed more than $3.2 billion in a sum of 7,000 forms, with client base nearly doubling last year. So the co-founders that I mentioned have been CEO Michelle Romano, 36, and Executive Chair Andrew DeSosa, 37, former Romantic Partners and Vast Experience as executives in the Canadian tech industry. So funds e-commerce startups via revenue-sharing agreements plus 6 to 12% fee. Investments range from $10,000 to $20 million. Blind funding algorithms help generate term sheets in 20 minutes. And accompanying software helps clients track metrics like revenue and ad campaign performances. Fund nine times more radically diverse founders and 25 times more women founders than the average rental capital portfolio. Clients include virtual eyelash company Glimrack and peer-to-proof underwear maker Ruby Love. So this is really big because it is kind of like mimicking dragons and a shark taken away because they are investing in these companies, but through an algorithm, which is really cool and really interesting. And uh, I wonder how this is going to play out because a lot of times humans, I was reading the book uh talking to strangers i finished the book really amazing highly recommend it and it was speaking about how as humans we often look towards people and expect that their faces and the way they speak is how what represents them whatever they're talking about so if i'm really really at a scene of a crime and i'm really really nervous i'm probably the person you know who committed the crime but sometimes that doesn't match. Sometimes people who are really nervous are just nervous people, and they didn't commit a crime. But then sometimes people who are confident in walking around actually did commit the crime, but we wouldn't suspect them because they're too confident. We see this a lot with serial killers and murderers, and we get a little bit of this iffy feeling, this weird feeling, because we're like, they're too charismatic to be a murderer, right? We have this image paint in our minds. So sometimes when you're looking at a pitch, they could be the same exact thing, and you could kind of get bamboozled because someone could be lying through their teeth, and you wouldn't know, and even if you got the financial statements, you wouldn't realize in how much shit they are um, until you signed yourself up for it. So this might be a really interesting way because, obviously, AI and computer generation, computer-generated items, they don't have this sense of psychology and, and looking towards people for answers. So this is a really interesting uh, look at it, and I'm really interested to see how that uh, kind of goes. Um, so the next one I want to talk about here, I'm kind of jumping around here. I want to see if I can find any interesting ones that I recognize. Um, or maybe names that interest me. Okay, yeah, OpenSea. This one's been huge. So OpenSea, you probably have not, actually, you probably have heard about it. It's all about NFTs. I think I've actually spoken a bit about OpenSea, but I want to speak about it here. So headquarters is in New York, New York. Uh, it has funding for $23 million from Andrew Nassine Horowitz, Paradigm, uh, Han Ventures, and others. $13.3 billion valuation has been processing about $3 billion in NFT transactions monthly, earning about $75 million in monthly revenue, which is insane, of course. The co-founders are CEO Devin Feinizer, 31, and CTO Alex Haltia, 30, became first NFT billionaires in January 2021. So founded nearly five years ago, this startup was an early player in the NFT market that took off in 2021. It operates as a peer-to-peer -peer platform where users can create, buy, and sell all sorts of NFTs in exchange for a 2.5 cut of each sale, which really isn't that much, but we have that many transactions, it's a ton. Um, although OpenSea is facing heightened competition, including from crypto giant Coinbase, which is huge, which has its own NFT marketplace in May, it continues to dominate the NFT market with more than 1.5 million accounts being transacted on the platform. So this one, again, is huge. The NFT space, regardless of if you think it, NFTs are, you know, a bunch of crap or not, um, it's really big, really huge, ever-growing. Uh, so OpenSea really capitalized on this market early, got before, you know, the big boom, and they were the boom, and that's how they made so much money. So I think that one's a really interesting one as well that you should be watching. Public.com showed up on this as well, so it is a new one, um, but I already spoke about that one. Um, let me see. I want to get a little bit of an interesting one here. 
There was an interesting one up here called Mercury that interests me just because of the name and Morty. So I kind of want to see what those are. So Mercury was headquarters in San Francisco, California. Funding is $152 million from Quartering Management, Andrew and Horowitz, who's funded a lot of these, CRV and others as a $1.62 billion foundation, billion dollar valuation. Customers grew fourfold to 45000 in 2021. There are a bunch of CEOs here, which I'm going to speed run through CEO, Iman Haknod, 38, so the mobile advertising sort of hey up to Fiber, $445 million in 2016. COO Jason Zhang, 31, CTO Max Tanger, 30, both Zhang and Tanger work for Abun at Hey up, so they've been co-workers. Digital banking platform for startups offering no fee checking and savings accounts, debit cards, large transactions, and currency exchange. Its $15 million in 2021 revenue came primarily from an interchange on debit card transactions and a share of interest on deposits. But in March, it expanded into venture debt term loans for up to 40 four years, typically between 25% and 50% of recent within the last 12 months equity funding round. Mercury, which charges interest and takes a warrant to buy a small amount of stock, aims to lend $200 million this year. So, um, it's been doing a lot of work. We've kind of mentioned companies that have been doing similar work, but it is digital banking for startups specifically. So, it helps them kind of get off the ground and uh lets them kind of had you know um debt term loans and different things that are kind of like a fallback for them so that one's an interesting one as well so i wanted to speak about here a little bit of a shorter one is morty's is in new york new york uh funding is 38 million from thrive capital year hypo uh hippo hippo uh i don't know how to pronounce it sorry march capital and others has a 150 million on the ocean it's a little bit smaller compared to the others has processed more than $1.2 billion in loans today, has a revenue of $3 million in 2021, up from $1.5 million in 2020. So not really a big profit margin there. CEO Nora Aspel, 39, and CTO Roman Ho- uh, Rothbolt, 38, an online mortgage marketplace founded and run by engineers. Morning aggregates mortgage rates from a range of lenders, offering buyers an easy way to search for competitive rates. Once a customer is locked alone, Morty guides them throughout the entire process step by step. Like more, like more old-fashioned mortgage brokers, Morty makes it money by charging lenders a fee when the loan closes. So it is very similar to a loan, but it it shows in the process, which I guess is an interesting way because I find with finance, a lot of people are in the dark and they don't really understand what is happening to their money or what they need to be doing with their money. And this kind of gives them that platform for that. So that is Morty. Um, this one caught my eye right now. Uh, has a big valuation. It is Good Leap, Roseville, California. Funding is $1.6 billion from New Enterprise Associates, Westcap, Michael Dell, and others. $12 billion valuation, and its app is now used by more than 18,000 home-improved businesses, from, up from the 12,000 at end of 2020. So it's gone up quite a bit in the last two years. The co-founders are Chair and CEO Haynes Barnard, 50, and Chief Revenue Officer Matt Dawson, 48, two longtime executives at Solar City, now Tesla. Energy uh, and Chief Risk Officer uh, Jason Walker, 48, a veteran mortgage baker broker. His platform and app have funneled 13 billion in financing to about 380,000 home owners, making green home upgrades. Half of that within the past year. Contractors and vectors use Goodly Point of Sale app to get customer loans instantly approved. Partner banks, including Goldman Sachs, make the loans and then. Uh, securize a debt to sell investors using a software to check loan performance. After starting with solar panel loans, last year Goodly was in more than 20 categories of sustainable improvements, include battery storage, energy and fishing windows, and water saving turf. I really like this one because it's focusing on uh, sustainable forces of energy and um, financing these homeowners to make these upgrades. Um, and it's, it's kind of making this really positive change in the space where it's saying, Hey, homeowners are a big part of the problem too. We need to, we need to help them fix this issue and we will fund them. So, um, partner banks have been able to help them and track the loan performance as well. Give them these people, these loans and kind of give them that stepping off point to do so. So that's a really big one. Good leap. And I would, uh, watch that one, um, heavily, I would say. 
the next one I want to talk about here is a few more that are kind of trickling my, you know, making me interested here before we end today's episode. This one is FTX. This one is just me because it is in Bahamas. It's in the uh, Nassau, Bahamas. Its funding is $1.8 billion from Sequa, Tesmec, Tom Bravo, and others. I think I've heard of this company before, but I want to make sure I have. Yeah, I have. It's crypto. <laughs> of course I have. Um, latest valuation is $32 billion, which I think is one of the highest we've seen on the list. It reached roughly $1 billion in revenue in 2021 and grew its customer base from 246000 to, in 2022, $3.1 million in 2021. An absolutely insane increase. The co-founders are CEO Sam Barkman fried 30, the world's second richest crypto billionaire, and CTO Gary Wang, 28. One of the largest crypto exchanges, uh, crypto trading exchanges in the world it handles some 11% of the 2.4 trillion in derivatives traded each month. That is such a large portion of such a big market. And anybody to have, you know, even, you know, 1% of such a big market is insane, let alone 11. The company raised $1.5 billion in private funding last year, jolting its valuation from $1.2 billion to $25 billion. $500 million raised this past year only took its valuation to $32 billion. Eager to become a household name, FTX is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing, setting up celebrity brand ambassadors include Tom Brady, David Orse, and Kevin O'Leary, or Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. After it goes after U.S. customers and separate entity, FTX U.S., we had a $8 billion. So this is absolutely huge in the crypto space. That's why I recognized it. Because I was like, hmm, this kind of, this name kind of rings a bell. It's huge in the business space. I'm so surprised how new this company as well. And I think as well with um, the other one, which was uh, OpenSea. I was very surprised how new it was. These companies, as you can tell, grow very fast. They hop under trends fast. They grow fast. There's a fast growth environment. Um, so... Really, to end off this episode, we've seen, we've understood, you know, we learned what fintech was. We understood the purpose of it, uh, how valuable it is, how we are moving away from banks, and we are going to more decentralized forms of transaction, and we are doing the things that are are more um, virtual, which is very important. We also realized some new uh, or big companies that are the future of investing, and these companies are going to change the game. The four ones that I first spoke about in the first article, which I will also link as well, the Columbia article I will be linking if you want some of those resources to learn more about fintech or learn about how you can get into the fintech market. But these were about the fintech uh, investors and um, kind of talking about, you know, high growth companies. And then as well, the FinTech 50, the newcomers have amazing uh, people who are doing amazing and huge, big things. And obviously their companies are valued at crazy, crazy, crazy high amounts, which we can also see. And we also notice um, some of the big ones, obviously, are like FTX, as I just mentioned, OpenSea. These ones that I didn't even realize were, you know, only like a year or two old are already valued at billions of dollars and have had revenue of billions of dollars. And it's just absolutely changing the game. Crypto and NFTs are changing the game and technology is changing the game. You can't run away from it. You can't stick to your old banking ways. You have to move and grow with the markets. And this is the future. FinTech is the future. It's already here. Uh, We can see with all of these companies, it's here. It's been here. And it's going to continue being here. It's not going away anytime soon. So my best advice is not as a financial advisor and anyone with any sort of credentials, but is to watch these markets, is to invest in them if you believe in them, if you do your research properly, of course, not just listen to this episode, but do your proper research and realize the actual potential behind these big companies. Because it is a fast-paced environment, uh, but that also means it can, it can uh, crash quick. So it definitely isn't always a safety investment, but if it's one that you truly believe in, anything is going to be high growth, it's amazing as well. So I think having a career in this area is amazing. It truly is because, again, it is such a fast-paced environment. So that concludes today's episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. I actually really enjoyed top- talking about this topic. Um, I think I'm realizing what I actually do enjoy talking about on this uh, podcast, which is important, and what I like to do which is also really important, where my passions are. 
Uh, so, to the this episode, as I usually do, please connect on the Instagram, which is ever.changingworld. Again, ever.changingworld. I use this one a lot. Twitter is everchangingwor. Again, everchangingwor. The website is shosaacast.com slash ever-changing-world. Again, shosaacast.com slash ever-changing-world. Thank you all so much for listening to today's episode. Please tune in next week. And, of course, follow the social medias to stay updated. Make sure you stay in the loop on what episodes I'll be posting. I always post on Tuesday nights usually, but, you know, you never know how, you know, time differences work, etc. And I always post when, you know, something's posted, especially on Instagram. Um, Next week, I am probably going to talk about big data, so tune in for that. Thank you all so much for listening. And the world is always changing.